Yeah. We are we are rolling. What up, Brent Pella? Brent, what's How good, you doing? Baby? We're in. Locked in. Are you locked in? I'm locked in, dude. I'm so locked in. You are. I'm so locked in. I like it. I used to be locked out, <laughs> but now we're locked in. Bro. I love it. We're here. I'm excited to have you here. I'm stoked to be here, dude. I'm a fan. I, I'm a fan too. I'm a fan. I like to learn. I want to learn from you. I want to. I want to. I want to be. I want to. I want to be you. <laughs> I want. I want to. I want to have your the blood mutual. type. I want to have your BMI. Hmm. Do people still study BMI? Is that still a thing? I don't know. Yes, they do. You remember the presidential fitness uh, exercises that we did? Did you do those in elementary school? I think so. Yeah. They did like your BMI test. You have to do like push ups in front of your whole class. It was embarrassing. You're I was not very good you. at that. Yeah. At that yeah. stuff. But yeah, they still they still do BMI. You've got a you've you look like you've got a. I'm I'm doing okay. A good BMI. I started a new peptide recently. What's the peptide? It's um, MK. Sixty-six something. MK Ultra. MK Ultra. Yeah. <laughs> I just think I'm taking a peptide, but I'm not. Um, it's uh, it's one of those. I forget, but it's a it's a capsule and it activates your growth hormone, so it just allows you to build muscle. So you're better. growing. I'm growing. Wow. I'm growing. I'm putting on a little bit of size. Putting just a little on. bit. Are you? Uh, what's your current fitness regimen like? I wellness do, routine. You do a lot of cold plunges. I, I do gather, a lot of cold plunges from your Instagram. Thank you for bringing that up. I wanted people to know right away that I do a lot of cold plunges, and they're very cold. Um, I, I, I've never been a gym guy. I've never been a gym guy. I played basketball in college. So we had a whole weightlifting program that we went through, but post college, I'd always liked outdoor workouts, like prison workouts, you know, mm. long runs on the beach, on Hills. I love Hills. I love stairs. Uh, so I'll go between like doing a three mile run that includes some type of like hill sprint or flatland sprint or a, one combination of the other. And then I'll mix in a circuit that's like uh, an assault bike circuit for five minutes, two or three different kinds of push-ups, a couple different kinds of sit-ups, kettlebell swings, uh, pull-ups. That's a lot. Yeah, but but I'll, I'll choose like three or four of these, and then I'll do like three rounds with those three or four things. Mm. And then the next day, I'll choose three or four things that I didn't do yesterday. And sometimes I'll try to isolate like um, back and – what is it? Back and buys, chest and tries, so that I'm focused more on muscle groups that work together. A bro split. Bro split, dude. Yeah, but it's uh, it's worked for me, and I feel really good. That's and great. I'm not getting injured, and there's definitely more to learn. I want to be a little more movement focused, but yeah, that's where. Were I'm you going. ever an athlete? Yeah, so basketball through high school and college, wow. and then still played competitively uh, post college for a while. With um, I coached at Kobe Bryant's camp straight out of college whoa yeah so i got to like play with these dudes over the summer and, and in la once a week and they, they had played overseas they had played d1 college some were former pros and um that was really cool so that kept me like active and in, in in like a dynamic movement workout at hmm. least once a week yeah. that was cool yeah did you always know you want to be a comic um no I'm still trying to figure out if I want to do this. Really? You know? No. <laughs> You're so good. Uh, thanks, bro. Uh, yeah, I was doing like comedy videos in college. Uh, then when I moved to LA, I saw a lot of people that were out on the live circuit doing stand up and sketch. And I started realizing that all my heroes that I had studied, Will Ferrell, uh, Jimmy Fallon, uh, Chris Farley, all these guys had gone through the live world, the mm. live on stage world. So, forced myself into that, started crossing paths with the video work and just combined to the madness you see today. That's so dope. And yeah, yeah when did your social media, like when did you start creating content for um, the socials? I was doing content for socials. In college, YouTube was big, but Instagram wasn't for videos yet. Hmm. And then 2015-ish, I started putting like comedy videos out here and there but they weren't anywhere near as well produced or thought out as mm -hmm. like some of them are today um but i really turned a corner in 2020 yeah that's what you blew up yeah i, I tripled down on video stuff for the first like six to nine months of 2020 because you couldn't tour i mean 2020 Twenty gave you so much material i didn't i <laughs> rarely had to write anything i'll just kind of repeat the madness that i saw so 2020 tripled down i went from one video a week to at least three uh, following started to tick up um, videos you know the more you do something the better you get at it so I kept figuring out new approaches to the craft and new ways to uh, say the thing I wanted to say or work in the message that I wanted to bake in and yeah so 2020 was a big curve but then this year has been the biggest 
growth too. And I've also been putting out the most stuff. So it's uh, the crazier the world gets, the better my career gets, honestly. So <laughs> hoping for more insane things to come. You do such a great job. And your content is like, it's, it's non-partisan. But you, yeah. you focus on like what's going on in the world. And for the past couple of years, it's definitely seemed like there's been a political, yeah. socio-cultural, political stew, you know? Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, you say it's nonpartisan, but <laughs> tens of millions of people probably think I'm a sexist, racist, phobic <laughs> uh, because I'm nonpartisan. Because, you know, these days, if you don't pick a side, you're on the wrong side. <laughs> um, but yeah, dude, I, I never did political stuff. Uh, before 2020. 2020 was like the first year I started producing content that had political commentary in it. And I was figuring out what I had to say about politics and the current state of events and uh, state of the world in 2020 with COVID and everything. And that my perspective kind of naturally got into this realm of like, all right, there's extremes on this side. There's extremes on that side. Not every topic is somewhere in the middle but every topic like or not every topic is neutral i don't want to be neutral on things but at the same time uh, there's there's right and wrong to both of these sides so where do i land do i land a little bit to the right on this a little bit to the left on this do i think both of those motherfuckers are dumb on this uh that was often the result um so yeah when 2020 hit and i started producing more political content i started to just become more aware of how the world works at the same time. So I wasn't like commenting from this separate observer space. I was commenting from a place of active involvement because I was becoming more aware of what was happening on the inner workings of policy and cultural movements and things like that. Dude, I can totally relate to that. Yeah. I've always been completely apolitical. Yeah. But I feel, I, I felt like, I think so many did like you did, in 2020 that I was having like a bit of an awakening. Like I was yeah, starting to yeah, see yeah. the Yeah, yeah, Was matrix. that kind of the year you started to break out? Totally. Yeah, dude. When I say that I was apolitical, I mean, I, I literally, you know, prior to 2020, like I, I didn't know who Tucker Carlson was. Right. Like I never watched right. the news networks or anything like that. Gavin Newsom meant nothing to me. Men, meant nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And now you're one of his biggest. Now, yeah. <laughs> now yeah. I need him around. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's it's, it's wild to see. And, and people, you can't really be apolitical anymore because politics are so so deeply entwined with our daily life today our culture yeah yeah you don't need to necessarily like choose a side and plant your flag and dig in your heels but you can't just say oh i don't i don't talk politics i'm not into politics you kind of have to be because even if you're not talking about policies or politicians or bureaucrats or legislation the issues that you're concerned with are rooted fundamentally in the political makeup of the country. So you're going to talk politics and you kind of need to know which way these issues lean politically in order to have a proper conversation about them. That's kind of how I've developed. Totally. And they're, they also are, they, they're now affecting culture in a way that I yeah. feel like they d didn't, you know, for, for the majority of my life up until yeah. about four years ago. Dude, I didn't know anything. About yeah. politics. 2016, I voted for Obama my first time ever voting. Yeah, same. Uh, literally because I saw him shooting jump shots with the University of North Carolina men's <laughs> basketball team. And I was like, oh, dope. Yeah, this guy's in. <laughs> yeah. That's all I need. 100%. He's a hooper? Give him the nuclear coats. <laughs> you know? Yeah. That, was, that was my approach to politics. Who has the best jump shot? Same. Yeah. Now it's a little bit more than that. <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of people still, though, engage with politics at that surface level. And yeah. yet they form yeah. really strong opinions about it. But... Yeah. I, I just, yeah, I mean, I worked for Al Gore out of college. Like, cool. I, yeah. I was. Uh, what drew you to him? Environmental stuff? No, not, I mean, honestly, not even that. Like, I, I, I barely even knew, knew who he was, to be honest. I yeah. just got a, an amazing job out of college hosting a TV network that he was the co founder of. Do you remember current TV between 2020? No, it was between 20, 2005 and 2011. There was a TV network mm. in the US back mm -hmm. when. We still watch TV. Yeah. Oh, like um, cable yeah, network? Like, yeah. Cool. Cable TV channel in 100 million homes. And I was plucked out of college to essentially be like one of the main hosts for the network. No way. Yeah. Were you hosting stuff in college? Were, I was, you, were you a journalist? I was, uh, I double majored in film and psychology and I made a documentary with, I was in the documentary that I had made. 
and I sent it to the powers that were at that at the network at the time, the president of programming, and you know ultimately it made it made its way up the ladder to to Al, and they essentially hired me to be one of the faces of the network. Wow! And it was, but it wasn't meant to be like a political platform for him. Yeah. It was just a, it was, it was, it aspired to be a news and information network. You know, I would describe it as CNN for young people cool. at the time. Yeah. Um, and I was, compl- you know, completely apolitical. So I can't say that I had any kind of partisan bent or anything like that. But the, ne- the network definitely skewed liberal. But, um, but yeah, so I worked for him for six years. And then, you know, I was a big part of the Obama, you know, campaign in the sense that on air and, and everything that I was doing offline, like, I, I you know, I, I promoted, um, I, I evangelized him. I voted for him twice, and mm-hmm. but still, I was like kind of in the same in that in the in the, a similar um, position as you, where yeah. I don't Service really know level. anything about the policy, no nope, policies or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, it was wild. Yeah, but then in 2021, it all started to like really affect our lives in a major way, um, and then you saw the how the how the media, you know, depending on what media you were consuming, was like a completely different narrative. Yeah, dude. Yeah. That first hit for me in 2016 because I was watching CNN the whole election night in 2016 and I was talking to my mom on the phone uh, and when when it started to look clear that Trump was going to win, my brain like started glitching. I literally like I, I remember being in such a state of shock, like such a state of shock because I had thought there's no fucking <laughs> way the dude who's grabbing pussies <laughs> is about to be leader of the free world. There's no way. And when, you know, Wolf Blitzer called it, I like I remember that visceral feeling of shock. And that's what a lot of people are feeling today or this week yeah. after this election, but I, I just remember that and I remember that shock st- being like kind of a catalyst for my uh distrust in what I had been fed and how I would, uh, how I would um, consume news and media forever changed on that day. I swore off CNN forever. I felt like they had lied to me. And it was like, su- it was just such a fucking awakening. Hmm. Um, and what's crazy is like, that's still happening. It's crazy that that happened again this year yeah. to so many people. So many people were just blatantly fed lies, dude. Just fucking like canola oil and a beer bong just shoved down their throats until it comes out their ass. It was awful. And they're wondering like, how could this have happened? Mm. And you know, it's because they ran the same playbook as 2016. Yeah. The same lies, the same force feeding fear. And uh, a lot of people are living with that shock. Yeah. And there's always, I, I think like a kernel of truth, but the, the fact that the media can get away with just s- such blatant, you know, yeah. misrepresentations of the truth. Yeah. It's, it's so shocking to me. And especially I think today, like we live, if nothing else, in the era of authenticity where people are having, you know, long form conversations on podcasts left and right. And these aren't like political experts that are hosting these podcasts, but nonetheless, like, you know, I think there's a real opportunity today that there haven't, hasn't been in the past for real nuanced conversation to like get out there and critical thinking, Mm -hmm. you know, because back even when I was, you know, doing the current TV thing, like, it was still part of this era where it was really all about the sound bites. You yeah. know, you'd get like a few moments with your, I mean, politicians, but also celebrities and thought leaders and comedians and whatever. Like, but now it's 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 such a different time, and I feel like there are fewer excuses than than ever to be duped by yeah those sound bites yeah. and those mistruths. Yep, yep. But they're still they're still duping. Yeah, they're still duping. There's still a lot of duping, dude. There's How do you duping? What I mean, what is a What's your information diet like? My information diet. Okay, that's a good question. I, I've tried to, I'm still carving out my information diet, just like I'm still updating my food diet. Yeah. You know, because there's, there's, um, there's healthy fats like, uh, you know, uh, independent journalists on YouTube, like Breaking Points. I really like Breaking Points, hmm. right? Crystal and Sager, they, I think they do a pretty good job of just getting to the point and um, they have a great show. So that's, that's my like animal protein. Right, yeah. that's my healthy fat. Mm. Um, I I I will scroll through uh, CNN and Fox and MSNBC like I'm eating a little bit of ice cream. <laughs> that's my cookie dough ice cream. But it's dope that you do. You make an effort to like look at 
all yeah. sides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. And it's also, you know, I, I want to see, A, I want to see what they're saying and how they're saying it. And B, I need material to make fun of. <laughs> yeah. And it's very easy to find that when you cruise through like Huffington Post on a daily basis. <laughs> Um, Does that but, still exist? I don't know. Actually, I haven't been on there for a while. I cut Huffington might, Post. Yeah. Like I cut canola oil. <laughs> uh, but I also really like scrubbing through Twitter. Hmm. And I've, I've kind of like curated my algorithm to show a lot of left-leaning journalists and a lot of right-leaning journalists. And I like to compare and contrast. Uh, and my favorite way to consume media and news is through long-form investigative journalism videos. Um, there's a dude, Johnny Harris, that does a really good job. He'll tackle one topic over like 20 to 30 minutes in, in a video um, and he'll go pretty deep. Uh, there's another one I just watched the other day. It's like a 20 minute video on YouTube about the $200 billion seed oil industry and that gave a lot more specifics that I didn't have before. So if there's a topic I wanna learn a little bit more about, I'll sit down with it and, and like for 20 or 30 minutes, I'll really try to do a deep dive into it. Uh, and then a big part of my media diet is not consuming media at all <laughs> and trying to just live life without it for a day or two in a row. But it's tricky because, you know, everything I do as an artist is informed by what's happening around me, right? So it's, it's tough to go on like a diet of media when I have like such a passion for um, – transforming what's happening around me into content or into entertainment or comedy or laughter. Hmm. So it's a tricky balance, you know, yeah. trying not to go crazy. Um, and at the same time, trying to give myself a break. What's your, like, uh, your, do you have a, 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 a routine when it comes to writing idea generation? Uh, not really. Sometimes if I haven't written in a while, I'll schedule like an hour to myself and I'll just put on a stopwatch and I'll cut off the Wi-Fi and just go just free write ideas or uh you know log lines or whatever um but these days it's, it's it's more like if i have an idea i'll write it in my phone and then later when i get a few minutes i'll go to the computer and try to beat it out into like a script format or something like that but it's it's the inspiration is everywhere <laughs> because people are so fucking nuts dude. Yeah. they're so crazy like there were there was a period for like two years where all i had to do was look up what gavin newsom did that week mm. And that was a new video. <laughs> and and I also didn't really have to stretch some of the shit that he did. <laughs> and um, yeah, so now I just kind of like, I, I have a much better perspective of my voice. I'm still fairly nonpartisan, you know, with some of the stuff I do, but some of the stuff leans a little bit in one direction. And that's because I think one particular direction has just a little bit more logic these days than the other. Um, but you know, there's other comedians that are like solid left comedians and they just toast the right and they never will uh, uh, say anything bad about the left that's mm. like too much, right? Like an SNL, like Saturday Night Live yeah. where that has gotten to today. Anytime they poke at the left, it's like a gentle prod. And it's like, ooh, look at us, we're being self-aware and da, da, da. But when they poke at the right, it's like a fucking knife. Mm. It's like a sharp jab. Yeah. And that's fine, that's their show. And that's what they want, there's nothing wrong with that. There's a whole audience that loves that. And then on the flip side, I have comedian friends that only take aim at the left and they'll never make fun of the right. And I think that's fine too. Well, I don't think there's a right or wrong way to do it, but I tend to just like lean a little bit more in the middle. Yeah. Uh, just naturally. Saying anything yeah. today is bound to get, is bound to inflame, you know, dude, a certain cohort. You also don't even have to say anything. <laughs> yeah. Being silence is violence. Silence if is you didn't violence. Know, yeah. Max. Okay, violence isn't violence mm -hmm. anymore. It's silence. <laughs> and like I, I have somebody in my life that is that like despises uh, somebody else in my life because that person didn't vote. So by not voting, you're now part of the problem mm. that the person has said is a problem. Like you're it, it, so it, there's no winning to some people unless you are explicitly on their side 100%. and like excruciatingly angry right now <laughs> if you're not like punching walls and and punching white men <laughs> in the throat you're part of the problem um, you're part of the problem white supremacy yeah 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 it's crazy it's, it's crazy. a crazy thing and i don't know how it changes um but my small contribution will be pointing out the madness whenever i can dude it's wild i've lost uh have you lost friends over the shit dude yes Fuck, dude. Yeah, it's, like, like it's for real, crazy. they've like cut off ties. The thing is, I haven't unfriended a single person. Mm -hmm. I haven't unfollowed anybody. 
And like, you know, most of my life was spent in this apolitical space. In fact, a space that was, while I've been apolitical, you know, my, um, my peer group has leaned largely like way left. Oh, wow. And, um, but so, so most of my friends are actually like, I would say more Democrat leaning. And, uh, but I've, you know, I haven't unfriended anybody based on the things that I see, you know, on my Facebook news, you know, my, my friend feed that I still have. I, you know, yeah. like I log into Facebook once a month, but you know, I don't, I haven't unfriended anybody. I've lost friends. Like, like Dude. acquaintances have texted me out of the blue that I haven't heard from in 10 years and have been like, you know, I'm done with this relationship. Haven't, you know, whoa. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, that, like a, a small, a, a small handful. Yeah. But nonetheless, like I posted on, on Facebook, like on my friend personal profile. And I was shocked at the level of intolerance that I... What did you post? Something chill, like you in a MAGA hat <laughs> holding up an illegal immigrant with a lighter underneath them? Well, yeah. Something chill? <laughs> Something like very chill like that, yes. <laughs> no, I posted, um, you know, on election night, I posted... I mean, this was a little cheeky, uh -huh. I'll admit, but I posted unburdened by what has been. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Yeah, it's fun. That's silly. Yeah. That's a silly thing. But nonetheless, you know. Sure. So... That's nuts. Um, and when people cut you off like that, it's like watching them build a layer of brick and cement of their echo chamber yeah. that they're constructing around them. I lost 2,000 followers in the past three days. Wow. Which a couple years ago, I'd be super bummed about. But now it kind of feels like I'm cutting weight. Yes. You know what I mean? Pruning. Yeah. Yeah. Feels like I'm, I'm a little bit leaner. <laughs> I'm a little faster. You know mm. what I mean? Uh, and it's because I posted a couple of memes, like I posted a photo of Joe Rogan, you know, interviewing Kamala in a UFC <laughs> ring. And the caption is like, what do you think happened out there? Um, and then I posted a picture of me with Bobby Kennedy because I'm a huge Bobby Kennedy fan. Yeah. Big fan. Performed at a couple of his uh, fundraising events uh, this past year. Um, and I had people like just by the dozens leaving. And I watched it. I would watch the following tick down. 2,000 people because of that photo. And it's like that wasn't even insulting, rude, gloating. It was like I y'all don't like me because I kind of agree with a dude who says maybe we shouldn't have plastic in our body and processed foods. That's, that's, that's where the hate – that's where the line is drawn. So – yeah, man, it's uh, it's I, I actually have like a lot of pity for people who do that because they're just they're constructing such a bubble mm. around themselves. Yeah, it's a bummer. Totally. It's and bummer. and Bobby's intent is so, I think, noble. Yeah. Right. It's noble. It's as noble as it is warped. Yeah. It's as noble as it is like twisted into fiction. But totally. Totally. I mean, I've seen just yesterday, the New York Times posted something calling him a vaccine. Uh, God, what was the exact word that they used? I forget uh, He that he opposes vaccines, How, I don't which know. he doesn't. No, dude. How many times does he have to say, you know, like, I think I feel like people need to make a, a checklist of all the things that they're terrified about. Like it might be a good mental health practice. Make a checklist of all these t t terrible things that you're scared of vaccines going away uh every immigrant being deported um uh world war three you know all these things national abortion ban and follow along over the next couple of years right to see maybe that would be a way for people to finally like understand they've been lied to about a lot of these things still it doesn't mean you're going to agree with all the policies but yeah dude i love bobby i like I heard of him for the first time two years ago, and you know I'd never he heard a politician or presidential candidate talk about getting fluoride out of tap water, right? Or like your pineal gland. Like the other day, he's talking about the importance of your pineal. What politician has ever brought that up? Exactly. You know, um, that's the closest we're going to get to a shaman in office. And then, but the, <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. And then you'll see people that are like. That, that seemingly feel so strongly about fluoride in the water. They're like... Crazy! Like something like that. What? Yeah. Since when do you feel like we need fluoride in the water, dude? The Like, that was nuts. On the picture I posted of me and Bobby, somebody was like, great. 
have fun with no fluoride in the water. And I was like, I, I'm going to have a great time <laughs> with no fluoride in the water. And they were like, cool. So you're all going to end up looking like Austin Powers <laughs> with bad teeth. And I was like, hey, bro, brush your fucking teeth, dude. <laughs> you know, we got mouthwash and toothpaste with fluoride for anyone who wants it. Mm. Wash, rin, uh, Do you even wash your mouth with fluoride? Because I guarantee when you drink water, not enough residually stays in your mouth as it would if you rinsed your mouth out with fluoride mouthwash twice a day. Am I making that up? 100%. I'm not a fucking dentist, like, but that's a guess. <laughs> right. That's an assumption. Why do you need to drink it? Bro, why do you need to drink it? Why? It's, it's being ingested. It's not staying in your mouth all day. So, yeah, that's bananas. And too. that's a really good point. You know, that's actually one of the reasons why counterintuitively, you know, you'd think that sugar-sweetened beverages are one of the main causes of tooth decay. Mm -hmm. It actually has very little impact on tooth decay because it's 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 so transiently in your it mouth. It skips your teeth. Yeah, yeah, it basically skips it. It, do, it, do, it doesn't get retained in the gum line the way refined grains and like gummy products right. like with or added sugar sugars food do. That yeah, sticks sugars in and there. food exactly. Yeah, Cuz it's interacting with your teeth. Exactly. Yeah. I haven't used when I was a kid I would get every dent every time I would go to the dentist for a checkup I would have a new cavity. Yeah. And I was on like a grain-based standard American diet for most of my most of my childhood, you know. But I ever since, you know, demoting grains in my diet, I still eat them occasionally, but you know, prioritizing whole foods and, you know, foods that actually like work your jaw in order to yeah, yeah. To, to consume. Um and you know, I, not only have I not gotten not not only has that been a, a switch for me, but I haven't consumed tap water because I live in Los Angeles, so I don't consume any tap water. Right. I consume, you know, bro, um, four times the uh, legal amount of arsenic in Los Angeles tap water. That's crazy. Which is crazy. Wow, it's I didn't, crazier I, when you think that there's a legal amount of arsenic in tap water. That's even crazier. That's wild. Yeah, saw it on uh, whatever that website is, EKG EWG or something. Yeah, if I don't know. Yeah, yeah. That's wild. Yeah. So I don't drink tap water. Arsenic. And I also I also don't that's crazy. And I don't and I don't brush I don't use uh, fluoride in my toothpaste. Yeah. And I for the past decade I haven't had a single cavity. So are you saying there's a correlation between grain grains and cavities? The sugar in grains? It's well, grain grain is basically pure starch. And okay. those are just like sugar molecules that begin to break down into sugar. You know, starch begins to break down into sugar almost immediately after you consume it because you have amylase in your mouth, which it's an enzyme that, that immediately begins to break down starch into sugar. Whoa. Yeah. So I haven't had a cavity in, yeah, a very long time. And I just, I was talking to somebody about this the other day, literally like last week. And we were talking about how we haven't really needed any dental work in a long time, like a very long time. And about, I don't know, Seven years ago, I started to shift to a mostly meat and fats diet and like this paleo slash keto slash carnivore type thing. And I've never had any mouth issues or tooth issues. And and I, I wonder, you know, because I grew up eating anything. We didn't, I didn't really have like restrictions. We, we, I didn't live a trashy life. My mom was like health conscious for sure. But there wasn't the amount of shared knowledge in like the collective consciousness the way there is now and there wasn't there weren't platforms and outlets like you or other people that were as popular as y'all are now like Callie and Casey Means and all these folks that are pushing for all these causes that wasn't around when I was a kid and if it was it was very small it was very quiet so I was eating like pancakes sandwiches <laughs> processed cheese cereals all the time all the time everything where canola oil is in the first three ingredients and I had cavities, dude. I had like three or four. Um, yeah, so so that that shifts into that's just it's interesting that you that you brought up grains because I never thought of that before. Yeah, they get yeah. retained. They get retained. They get retained. The that's gum true. line bacteria goes to work. Mm -hmm. I've had probably a dozen cavities in my life. Like I've had, Damn. yeah, when I was a kid. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in New York City. We had access to healthful food, but I, yeah, mm -hmm. Intamin's cakes and yeah. all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shit was good, dude. Shit was really Not good. Not going to lie. Yeah. A cold Yoo-Hoo. Yeah, right? I used to bike from my from my house where I grew up. It was like a 10 or 15 minute bike ride to a Rite Aid, like a CVS type of spot. And I would bike there every weekend and I would get a box of Milk Duds and a Blue Gatorade. Mm. And I would chill out outside. And I felt like this was from like age 10 through 16. Um, and I would eat my Milk Duds and have my Blue Powerade and go home. 
and I looked at like the ingredient. I think there's something in that Powerade that's like illegal in Europe. And, <laughs> you know, the milk duds are just like absolute trash in every form. Uh, it's nuts. And also in high school, when I played basketball, we would have pasta nights, bro. Wow. We would have pasta nights. And like the, the night before the game, we would meet at one of our teammates' houses the night before a home game, and we'd have a big-ass pasta night from, like, a round-table pizza. We'd get these big catered dishes of lasagna and breadsticks and spaghetti and, and like, the whatever salad, uh, and, and we would just feed, like, stuff ourselves with pasta. And it was the nastiest like good shit. Time. And the kicker is my JV coach was a fucking doctor. He was like a really well-respected physician in town. Whoa. And that was our diet, dude. There was no focus on organic. There was no focus on red meat. There was no focus on electrolytes and salt. None of that. None of it. So, you know, the the movement that has sprung from, you know, people like you, Callie, Casey, Bobby, and all these other folks, uh, I really hope that that gets into like youth programs hmm. in the next couple of years. Yeah. Cause I think that's, yeah, dudes in college are getting on board from podcasts and young adults are getting on board when their metabolism slows down and they're trying to figure out why they're so fucked up. But if we can change, if, if the perspective can change and people like JV basketball coaches, that shit is going to register with kids and be stuck in their heads forever. Hmm. And maybe we would have had a winning record. Dude, you know, I yeah. think we might have beaten Woodland High. <laughs> I think we might have. Where'd you grow up? Davis, up near Sacramento. Oh, wow. Yeah, California born and raised. California born and raised. Yeah. Man. Yeah, so many athletes, I feel like, pound that stuff, like pastas and things like that. And they end up with gut issues. Like, I, I know many yeah. athletes who grew up. They were high performers and they were lean, jacked, but mm -hmm. they suffered from crazy gut issues from as a result Damn. of eating all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's, we just ate it without even thinking. Wild. Yeah. What do you mean? This election has been called, I thought it was really, I was actually watching CNN last night and they were calling this election the testosterone. Election. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> the manosphere. An, a, an election that was won largely by what has been called the manosphere. I thought uh -huh. that was really interesting. Okay. A really interesting take on it because obviously the ele election was won by Donald Trump and it was seemingly a landslide, mm -hmm. but you know, one of the, I think, key points of differentiate differentiation between this election and ones prior was that, you know, the candidates embraced pod well, certain candidates more than others embraced yeah. podcasting as a medium. And the biggest podcasts in the world reach an audience that's mostly men, which I think is a demographic that has traditionally been not super enthusiastic about voting. Yeah. Men vote at a lower rate than women. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Yeah. Um, long form podcasting is going to change the election process from now on for sure. We will never have another presidential candidate that does not do a slew of long form podcasts in their campaign. Kamala barely did them. Barely. This yeah. year. She did like Shannon Sharp. Call her daddy. Uh, call her daddy. Yeah. You know, that was the biggest one I think she did. I don't know if we'll ever have another presidential candidate that doesn't go on Rogan. Yeah. Like, I think he's going to get every presidential candidate from each side. He might even get some during the primaries. Hmm. And that's going to be wild to, to see. Yeah. Because she, I, I don't think she would have done well on his podcast. I think she should have gone on for sure. They asked him to fly. They to asked her. him to fly out to her and do it for an hour in a room where they would have had secret service. And it's like, I'm glad no. he didn't do that. Yeah. I mean, I wanted to see her on his show. Yeah. But that wouldn't have been his show. That wouldn't, have that been would show. have been her show. Yeah. It would have been their show. So I think we're going to see that. Um, I, I, I get how I get the argument people have that, some of these major podcasts go to mostly men like Theo Vaughn, Joe Rogan, the Nelk Boys. What other ones did Trump do? Uh, Dana or Lex Friedman. Yeah. Um, what's the other guy? Bald white Andrew guy. Andrew Schultz. He did Schultz. He did um, what's uh, shit? Whatever. There's another guy. I forget his name. Ryan, maybe. I don't know. Hmm. Um, but what do we just name? Six or seven, right? That mostly go to men, right? Uh, that doesn't mean they're only for men. Yeah. Right? Like, 
ladies, listen to the podcasts, dude. <laughs> They're out. And if you want uh, them to go on like a huge female podcast platform, start that. And uh, unless that already exists, I don't know. I'm in my own manosphere, so I don't know what the <laughs> large. I don't know what the equivalent would be. Maybe it is Caller Daddy. But like you, you've heard of Joe Rogan. Mm. You know Trump went on Rogan, so you can't really like people on the left can't really blame the male demo because Trump went on a male targeted podcast. It's yeah. still a podcast that's available to everybody. It just takes willingness to listen to it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and also willingness to go on it by the other side. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's gonna be really funny to watch Theo Vaughn ask presidential candidates if they've ever done cocaine. It's also, one, <laughs> yeah, that was wild. Yeah. And they were talking about, that's crazy. Can't yeah. even do cocaine anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Theo's great. It's it, it felt like retribution in a way. I was like, I Googled because I wanted to hear, I wanted to learn more about this concept of like the manosphere and what, you know, what the mainstream media is talking about it. And I saw this article from the New York Times. It was published in on April 14th, 2024. And it's an, it's an opinion piece. I don't know if you saw this, but the New York Times in April of 2024, the opinion piece, the, 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 the title is The Atmosphere of the Manosphere is Toxic. So it's like to disparage, you know? Yeah. Like all the men out there who are getting their information from long form, pot, taking the time to listen to long form nuanced conversations. It just felt like retribution in a way. Yeah. That, that felt kind of nice, you know? Yeah. I mean, my and my podcast doesn't reach like... I'm not part of the manosphere. I, no, you but know. you are very toxic. Very toxic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel toxic just being here. Yeah. I feel like we're both being toxic. But I mean, maybe I, that cancels out each other's toxicity. So we're actually maybe, yeah. quite healthy. Um, but yes. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was very interesting. Another, uh, I think another really interesting thing is that most of the big, most of the big podcasts that these candidates, you know, went on are hosted by comedians. Yeah. What do you think? Like, I, I think that is such that's such a sign of people so so the biggest podcasts are hosted by comedians. There was a very clear threat of freedom of speech on social media by Kamala's campaign. They said it word for word. They said there needs to be regulations, there needs to be oversight on what can and can't be talked about on social media platforms. Even from outside her campaign, Hillary right. Clinton, John right. Kerry. Yeah. Um, comedians, you know, like it or not, literally are the last stand it, with free speech because we go on stage with a microphone and talk about literally anything we want. It's the whole archetype of the court jester. You're allowed, there, there are no barriers to what you can say. Um, so I think just just metaphorically speaking presidential candidates going on comedian podcasts is such a huge movement forward for culture and for freedom in a, in a way um <clears throat> because if 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 they had avoided comedian podcasts and only gone on these scripted platforms which she did a lot uh there would be that's just more control of narrative that's more control of narrative that's more control of what people then consume and believe but going on comedian podcasts there there are no boundaries no mm. breaks no boundaries and i think that will motivate or inspire people who listen to those long form podcasts that have no breaks that have no goal no goals that have no like checkpoints mm. maybe that'll inspire people to want more of that in politics and media to want more platforms like cnn msnbc fox whatever to pull the brakes back mm. like get rid of the scripts here let's have a conversation let's not paint this person one way or the other um and set them up for failure with gotcha questions or interruptions or whatever yeah so I think presidential candidates going on, I know I'm rambling a little bit, but hopefully that wasn't a total Kamala word salad. <laughs> I, I think that might've been a couple croutons in there, but um, I think it's, I think, I hope, 
I, my, my hope would be that presidents going on comedian podcasts will help shift the public want away from legacy media styles of interactions and into more open-ended, non-structured uh, conversations and, and communication. Yeah. Right? Makes perfect sense. Yeah. I also feel like comedians are the most valuable, especially today, the most valuable social commentators. Yeah. They also, like, if you talk to a comedian, you're going to get fucking humanized for better or worse. You know? No comedian's going to talk to you with, like, some scripted ass questions. Right. I'm going to ask, you know, if if you've ever shit your pants. <laughs> if you're a presidential candidate and you've never shit your pants, I'm not voting for you. Okay? Right. You don't take enough risks, right? And you're clearly not enjoying life. So, like that would be my question for a presidential candidate. Yeah. Have you ever shit your pants? Have you ever shit your pants? Yeah. If so, when and where? And if not, why? And would you like to? Right? Yeah. Because I got nicotine pouches downstairs. You <laughs> put 30 of those motherfuckers in your gums yeah. and we'll have a hell of a night. Kamala so, would definitely not answer that question. She would not answer that question. Yeah. She's probably never shit her pants. Trump, for sure. For, for sure. For sure has shit his pants. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> I think, you know, that that's what we'll get to is we'll get to see these politicians with their fucking reptile skin ripped off. Yeah. You know, like the day Gavin Newsom runs. He has to go on long form podcasts. Yeah. He has to. Yeah. And we're going to watch him melt on camera. Or maybe he'll change some of his ways and become like a genuinely good person. I don't know. Hmm. Um, but I that's, I think, a huge benefit of having political candid uh, presidential candidates do comedian podcasts. Yeah. But it's like the commentary from, you know, you and Tim Dillon and. You know, sometimes it turns up the volume on these on these like cultural issues that yeah. might not necessarily necessarily be apparent without the you know the hyperbole and the and the um you know the 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 extreme degree to which you, to to which you guys take it. Like for example, you know, in twenty twenty, suddenly like any every cis white hetero guy was deemed racist. Right. Yeah. And it's like your guys content, you know, like your, yours in particular, you know, like the fact that like suddenly everything was right, you know, everything. Yeah. Yeah. It, it spoke to this like truth in a way that just made it like it, it made it really plain to see. Like, yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, like what's going on in, yeah. so in society and, and how like n incorrect that is, you know. Yeah. And people spoke up about that on Tuesday. Yeah. Like it, they made a real clear dude. I'm so happy it was a landslide. I just wanted it to be a landslide either way. Whoever won, I just I was hoping it would not be close, so mm. that the message was fully received by the other side that this is what the majority of people want. And whoever lost, like if Trump had lost and it went this way in the opposite direction, I would hope that people would have gotten the message: Oh, we're living in a country where a majority of people want this to happen. So maybe I should try to understand them a little bit more. Mm. And it happened in this way, where a majority of people want these policies want this shift away from weird fucking woke shit want to yeah. not be talked to and con in a certain way and condescended and lied to and lied to. Yeah. And it's, you know, there are two frames of mind about it for with people on the left, either you're sexist, racist, phobic, misogynist, and you're stupid or, um, there, I do see people like genuinely trying to understand, mm. like really shocked as hell. And can't believe it, but like, why did you guys vote for him? And I see that I do uh, for here and there, and, I, and I'm I'm stoked on that because I think well, usually that comes from people just not liking his character, and I and I right. completely right. understand right. that. I don't like his character. Yeah, I mean that, that's why my post. You know, when I when I I shared this post on 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 Instagram and on X that went pretty viral, and you know, I mean my my perspective is that I wasn't necessarily. I mean, yes, I voted for him, but I wasn't really voting for him so much as I was voting against right. all of the lunacy that we've right. seen over the past. Right. You know, four years. I would. I think you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who doesn't think he's a narcissistic asshole. That's like who he is. But I also kind of like. I mean, to be fair, I do like that he is kind of like a bull in a china shop. He is like yeah, the bull in the yeah, china yeah. shop. Yeah. He's, the, he's the blunt tool that I feel like. You know, I'm I'm hopeful. Like obviously, I don't right. know what he's going to end up doing, and right. it could be. You hope all... he's not the narcissistic asshole that's going to like cause major global problems. But I do expect <laughs> that this is right. But I do expect that this is going to be a much different. I could be again, and I, and I could totally be wrong, and I could be eating my words. But I do 
think this is going to be this is I, I anticipated being a much different presidency. This way go around. different. He knows what he's doing. He knows how to navigate shit. He's got all. Uh, he's got the House. He's got the Senate, and the people around him are like incredible. Tulsi, Elon, yeah, the smartest fucking guy in the world is voting a certain way. You gotta consider why, bro. What a hero. Yeah. So, yeah, he's he's. I think he's a narcissistic dick, but he's the only person in United States political history to like. He, draw back the bullshit curtain on his own party his own party he came in and fucking cleaned house on in the republican party and somebody on the left has to do the same bernie even said the other day he was like we need to figure out why trump how he took over the republican party and changed it to this because clearly we're doing something wrong mm. and we don't have a trump which is ironic because fucking bernie was the trump for the democratic party he was yeah and he got totally screwed so, yeah, dude, as far as character goes, people can't get past character. A lot of people cannot get past character. They can't. That person in my life that I told you about that is currently not speaking to this other person in my life, the 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 shunner, the person who's shunning, um, just cannot get past the morality issue of Trump because he's so immoral and mm. he's so god-awful as a person. And it's a really... It's like... I don't, I don't know if it's as extreme as like being in a cult, but it's maybe adjacent to like being in a cult and not being able to like tear out that software so that you can approach the topic differently and, and remove his character from the equation. But yeah, his character is also, I don't think we would have Trump without him being a narcissistic dick. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think we would have any of this without him grabbing women by the pussy unfortunately <laughs> yeah and I, I, I prefer he never said that and I prefer yeah that he w wasn't a narcissistic dick but I think at the end of the day w w you need to vote for the the policies yeah you know that you prefer to see that are going to impact people's lives yeah you know the weight of that statement the grabbing by the pussy statement I thought that was uh, going to disqualify him. I still think that should disqualify somebody from ever being president. But the weight of that statement and the weight of the other like character issues that he has for people who voted for him, all that stuff is so outweighed by the weight of the things they disagree with on the left. So like character issues aren't even a question for MAGA Trump supporting right. folks. 100%, right, 100%, yeah. Because it's just not weighted the same. Well, it's like, you know, it, it, it feels like he's going to, in whichever way he he's able to, put an end to the, you know, the, the gender ideology stuff that's being pushed on children. Um, How about health? Do you think Bobby's really going to make a big change if he gets HHS? Do you I, think, I don't know the legality and the bureaucracy of like passing laws and shit, but... I just love him and what he stands for. And I'm curious what you think yeah. as far as like what could actually be changed. Well, I don't, I think that my hope and what I think is the most uh, enticing um, angle on which he's campaigned is the, is, is putting an end somehow to the revolving door and the conflicts of interest that we see yeah. in our regulatory agencies, whether the FDA or the USDA. It's just not fair that, you know, one year you'll have somebody, you know, a chief, you know, of, you know, some high level executive um, or officer at the FDA who then the next year is working at one of the pharmaceutical agent right. you know companies that they were tasked to, to to regulate and and vice versa like it goes both ways that's the revolving door metaphor i think that's unfair the fact that in 2020 you know the dietary guidelines for americans committee 95% of people on that committee had ties to either the food industry or the pharmaceutical industry i mean i think that's that's just unfair and the american people are paying the price for that with their health mm -hmm. I think that if he can do anything about that, I think that would be amazing. You know, I don't, I don't see him going through, you know, and and changing the availability of of ultra processed foods, which are at the foundation of the chronic disease epidemic. The, like, like, you know, making those any, you know, less available. And at the end of the day, I think people should have should have choice. Yeah. I think people should be able to eat whatever they want. Um, 
but there does need to be some regulation. You know, there is, I, I don't know why, you know, a company like Kellogg's, how they can get away with, you know, having chemicals in children's food, food marketed, foods that are marketed to children that are either illegal or come with, you know, warning labels in other countries. Crazy. You know, and they're yeah. sold here. Yeah. I think one of the biggest positives that that would come from him getting that role in the cabinet would be he has the platform to give people information now and even if he you know he's not going to make canola oil illegal right tens of millions of people are going to eat canola oil forever are they going to be a little bit more fat sick and stupid yeah probably (laughs) um but he's going to have the platform and the resources to get out language and communication about things like canola oil, fluoride, uh, red 40, hyperactivity, hypertension, yeah. bad ingredients, you know, all of that. I think that might end up being the biggest plus. Um, cause policy takes a long time, but changing your mind can happen overnight about these things. I'm still learning shit about like the, uh, the, this, this deep dive I did into seed oils a few weeks ago. I cut seed oils. Maybe What'd you find? A little over a year ago. So uh, I cut. I, I started cutting seed oils over a year ago, and I had just kind of lived with this kind of headline language about it. You know when you read the headlines and that becomes what you say about a topic because you can't fucking remember anything else? <laughs> so I was like, yeah, seed oils are bad. They cause like inflammation and they're really not, you know, naturally found and they're processed and made by machinery and you probably shouldn't eat them and that's why I cut them. Blue. And I felt like good saying that. But a couple of weeks ago, I did a much deeper dive into the, um, the three types of fat that are found in your brain, right? AA, DHA, and linoleic acid. And how AA and DHA are uh, thought of to be two of the main um, causes of brain growth. Two million years ago when our brains became big, a lot of research has been done and, and theories have floated out that AA and DHA, two of the three common fats found in the brain, uh, are helpful to cognitive function and brain growth. DHA most often found in raw fish. And, uh, you know, a country like Japan has one of the highest IQs, if not the highest in the world. So there's a correlation there between cognitive function and a raw fish heavy diet, right? And there's other correlations too, but um, then linoleic acid is, has a lot of the opposite effects of AA and DHA. And whereas AA and DHA can be correlated to, you know, reaction time, IQ, uh, mental stamina and, and um, neurological activity. Linoleic acid can be correlated to the opposite of all that. And linoleic acid is found in insanely high amounts in canola oil. And if you look at the charts of our uh, like average IQ, you see trends of the IQ nationwide going down as the introduction of canola oil came into our diet. Um, and it's it's crazy to see because it's in fucking everything. Mm. It's in everything, dude. And it, it linoleic acid too uh, can knock DHA out of the reset. Do you already know all this? Am I repeating shit for you? No, I want to hear I want to hear okay. your your take. This is a controversial topic by the way. It's a controversial you, you must topic. know this, right? Like that oh, people totally, are, yeah, there totally. are there are People in both, it's become politicized almost like. Yeah, and I'm not, and also government. everything I say is I'm, I'm definitely like parroting information, <laughs> but I did fact check a couple of these things and I read through papers. I don't have the fucking bandwidth to be an expert, so I'm for sure parroting some things, but the things I'm parroting are the things that I checked into yeah. with the limited capacity I have to do extra <laughs> research. So linoleic acid can knock out DHA from um, it's uh, it, the spaces in your brain where it's active and it can take its place. And, you know, you, you find that societies and cultures around the world that are uh, heavy with linoleic acid have a lot more common problems than cultures and societies that are not. Um, well, there's, de- there's definitely like a correlation between you know, the presence of linoleic acid in the diet and um, all kinds of other, you know, 
the issues mm-hmm. that that have coincided with the the essential flooding essentially the flooding of our food supply with this with this yeah. fatty acid you know i mean like our foods become more processed the availability of of added sugar has has exploded but um but yeah i mean this is like a we're consuming more of this fat than ever before in human history. It's crazy. It's yeah. 10 times the amount that it was in like the 50s. I, I'm pretty what? sure that's a stat. You check that. Well, our, our, but if I recall correctly, like our consumption of soybean oil alone has increased a thousand fold. Yeah. Either a thousand percent or a thousand fold. Yeah. And it's in, it's, every, it's in everything from baby food onward. And the reason it's in baby food is because they have to manufacture the baby food to represent the most common uh, nutritional profile of a mother's breast milk. And because canola oil is in every fucking person's diet, they have to put a certain amount of canola oil in the baby's food. So you're actively making your baby dumber. (laughs) Actively, dude. Whereas if you're on a diet that has no linoleic acid and canola oil and seed oils, but you're eating like raw fish here and there and and fish-based foods, uh, you're getting more DHA. They did a whole study where they, they gave a group of monkeys a high DHA diet and another one not. And the group of monkeys had like more brain activity Hmm. and their brains like grew a little tiny, tiny bit. Wow. And yeah, it's nuts. The, when there's so many correlations like that, it just feels like to me, it's a causation. I just take it as a causation that 2 million years ago stat when our brains started to grow, if our bodies grew at the same rate as our brains did over the past 2 million years, the average height of a woman would be 8.5 feet. Yeah. That's nuts, right? Yeah. So if you if you correlate the increase in our DHA diet to that, um, which you can, because around two million years ago humans started to hunt more, and we get like you can't really you don't really find a lot of DHA in ruminant animals, but you find it a lot in raw fish. And around yeah. two million years ago, a lot of societies were raw fish societies. So um, eat sushi. <laughs> That's. The moral of the story. Go eat some fucking sushi. Put it into your budget. Um, and uh, and be smart. <laughs> yeah. Amen. No, I agree. I um, There's no essential need for the consumption of seed oils. There's none. And you know, do you know Crisco is cottonseed oil? I didn't know that. Crisco was started by dudes, somebody who like... I mean, all seed oils were originally lubricants for machinery yeah. in the war. And then they just the war ended, and they had too many, too much seeds, too much machinery. They didn't know what to do, so they just decided to make it edible and fucking sold it to people. That's crazy. And so the the inventors of Crisco got in on that game, and they processed cotton seeds to make it look like lard. So it's just cotton seed oil that's like coagulated into solid Crisco. It's fucking disgusting, and it's a two hundred billion dollar empire. And there was a donation to the American Heart Association right around the time where they took butter and animal fats off of the pyramid. It was a $1.7 million donation to the American Heart Association. And like within a couple years, they removed that, they removed animal fats and butter and they put in like canola oil to use sparingly in that top area. So yeah, dude, that corruption like that, if stuff like that can get uncovered in today's day and age with factual information to back it up, we're, that's a huge like shift in human consciousness. And then... Maybe once our consciousness shifts, the fucking aliens will finally show up, dude. Maybe then they'll find. Maybe they're not showing up because we're still eating seed oils. You know what I mean? And they're just like these dumb monkeys. They're eating cotton. What are we doing here? They're eating engine lubricant. They're in. They're eating engine lubricant. Get me back to the wormhole, bro. I'm out. We'll come back in a couple hundred years. I'm out. I'm out of here. That's so fun. Same with uh, grapeseed oil. Grapeseed oil, they would throw out the seeds of grapes as a part of the winemaking process. Right. And then right. somebody realized that you can press these seeds for oil, run them through a mirror. Uh, uh, somebody realized you can turn them into poison. You can turn them into poison. And make a bunch of money. Yeah, make a bunch of money. Yeah. A bunch of gold. Crazy, dude. Give them their seeds. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. nuts. Yeah. The seed... The seed uh, um, what is, what is the guy called that pans for gold? What do you call that guy? He's not a forager. That's not that's not oh, the right. Uh, he's, a, he's a not a goldsmith. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's there was a name for yeah. that person. Ah shit! Damn. He's not a panning guy. Ask uh, chat, and I gotta ask ChatGPT. ChatGPT. I use ChatGPT for everything now. Oh my god! I hope it, they don't it, store it. ChatGPT. What, what do you call the guy <laughs> who pans for gold? Like, what's the name for a person who pans for gold? <laughs> 
Prospector. A prospector. Prospector. I never Seed oil that. prospector. Wow. That was the joke. All right. I'll wow. write that down for later. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Dude, crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I am definitely... Um, I, when I'm eating in a restaurant, I, I, I certainly consume them, although I try to try to avoid I ask, them. I ask for no... You do? Oh, yeah. Every restaurant I go to, I say, what do you cook the burger in? Wow. What do you, what do you cook the steak in? Mm. Uh, even when, when we got sushi the other day, um, there was a roll. You know, there's tempura rolls. There's fried rolls. I said, do you guys cook with canola oil, vegetable oil? She's like, yeah. I said, oh, okay, I'm not going to get that. <laughs> uh, burger, I'll ask for butter or olive oil. Hmm. Um, I, I don't totally trust olive oil unless it's like a high-end restaurant because yeah. a lot of it's cut. medium or lower restaurants will either have cut olive oil or they'll cook the olive oil improperly and it'll get too high reach a smoke point and that puts toxins in your body too so yeah. i yeah i am I'm, I'm pretty much 100 percent now asking for no seed oils at restaurants i feel like though i've seen some of the pushback to the whole like anti particularly rfk's like position on seed oils and i i, I what, is, what is it what is the pushback well like that it's just that it's so, not that bad for you. Well, the pushback is that if you were to remove all of the seed oils in the American diet um, and replace them with like another fat, say avocado oil, mm-hmm. f- just for the sake of the argument, that we're still going to be trending towards widespread obesity, and that obesity is really one of the biggest problems, and that we overconsume hyperpalatable junk foods, and that's why we're not just so overweight as a population, but that we are you know, so metabolically ill. Yeah. And um, I do tend to agree that. Wouldn't it just be a, a piece of the puzzle then? It's not the Correct. That's puzzle. my, yes, that's yeah. my hypothesis that, yeah. you know, it's, you generally want to be suspect of, of anybody who's pointing a finger at one singular boogeyman. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's yeah. often the case with the seed oils. And I think the argument would be a lot more compelling and probably a lot more convincing to, you know, scientists and 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 medical prof- healthcare professionals to to present it with like a little bit more nuance. Like, okay, maybe removing the seed oils from the American diet is not going to magically make the whole population healthier overnight, right. but right. it is like a part, probably, of the problem. Totally. And that the evidence that we have to say that they're universally safe is evidence that's essentially bought by yeah. by these industries. You yep. know, so we need to be a little bit more skeptical. A little that, bit. It's a rung on the ladder, dude. It's a rung on the ladder. Yeah. That, the revolving door shit, the factory farm system that's totally broken, pesticides, fluoride, uh, like not uh, the uh, offering donuts and cheese as common snacks and breakfast instead of not breakfast. Like encouraging not breakfast. Yeah. Encouraging a water and electrolytes for breakfast. Oh, that... <laughs> Could change a lot, right? <laughs> there are so many things, dude, um, that I have to keep track of now. I get like so overwhelmed. Do you ever get overwhelmed by the amount of shit that you have to keep track of, like not to do? Like I can't, I can't drink tap water. I can't wear polyester clothes. I can't fucking touch receipts now anymore. I got to be scared of receipts. Um, like I can't eat anything that's not organic. Uh, bed sheets have to be organic cotton or linen. Um, I don't want to wear shoes for too long because that cuts <laughs> off my electrical connection with Pachamama. Um, <laughs> sunglasses. Sunglasses are bad. Definitely don't wear sunglasses. Don't wear hats either. Don't wear clothes, really. Don't wear clothes. Shower in dirt and stay the fuck away from receipt paper and you'll be a healthy human. That's like where I'm at. There's so many things. Do you ever feel that way? Yeah, all the time. I'm sure a lot of my there's listeners relate. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot. But, you, you know, in, in thinking about that, it's like, yeah, there's a lot to stay away from. But staying away from all that shit should kind of be the norm. We've created this weird norm where we're dressing in plastic clothes, right? And we're we're drinking food dyes down like it's nothing. Mm. And seed oils and all these other weird chemicals that are in our system. And we aren't ever out in nature. Uh, so, like, we've shifted away from the norm. So, it's not like a new normal. It's like the OG normal. It's the original normal yeah. that we're trying to get back to. And the uh, the advancements in, like, medicine and technology combined with living that, like, original life 
as close as you can, as close as you can get to it, that could help us live a really long and happy life. I think so. Yeah, yeah. Our baseline has just become so screwed. Yeah. It's like there's a there's a meme that I see sometimes uh, in the wellness world that goes around. It's like today, you know, somebody who's eating health, the minute you try to eat healthy, you're instantly labeled as dieting. Yeah. Today. Or, uh, you know, far right conspiracy. Yeah. 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 Either way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. It's um, but you know, receipt paper will kill you. Well, how do you wrap your head around? <laughs> that's what I mean. It is coated with BPA. Like I know, a, I know. hundred to a thousand times. Yeah, more I don't than, touch it anymore. Yeah, I, it's I can't more. Touch it. I don't. Yeah. yeah, get your shit delivered electronically, or yep. just like, I mean, how bad do you need a receipt? For dude, your... somebody held up a receipt to me. I was like, hey, bro, watch the <laughs> fuck out, dude. Okay, watch where you swing that thing. All right, I'm receipt free over here. Receipt free. I'm receipt free, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get it. I get it. I don't want to be touching that shit, especially like if you're, I'm not a parent, but if you're a parent and you're touching receipts right? and then you're touching your kid or you're letting yeah. your kid grab the receipt. Dude, there's more. Plastic bottles. Don't drink out of plastic bottles. Uh, Brita filters are made of plastic, so you can't do that. Um, candles. Don't light candles in your house because the candle, I saw that clip. That was you, motherfucker. <laughs> that, was me. that was on this podcast. Dude, that chick broke me, dude. Because we have a fireplace at home and we keep candles in the fireplace. Big candle so guy. That we don't have to light a fucking fire all the time. We just have a nice little vibe. And now I'm realizing I'm inhaling candle meat and I'm like 10% fucking candle now. There's no winning. There's no winning. There's only trying. <laughs> only trying. So how, do you, so how do you not let this stress you out? That's oh, like no. Did you, did you see me? <laughs> I'm there, bro. Um, it's 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 uh, little by little. Little by little, I try to implement new things. It's a constant journey. It's a constant progression, uh, you know, until the day we die to, well, to make think, our lives a little bit better. Do you think better. it's fear-mongering to, to raise these flags? Or do you think it's like once the knowledge is out there, you have this knowledge, it allows you to kind of adjust your behavior in small that ways way. that might over the long term might you know yeah. emphasis on might over the long term have a positive impact on your health that one the it's it's very easy to classify it as fear mongering when i saw paul saladino's video about receipt paper i was like come on dude come on bro what's next man looking at my mom for too long is gonna <laughs> make me not be able to see far distances you know what are we doing here um but it's it's real info. And are you going to get cancer from touching receipts too much? No. But is the average American ingesting a credit card worth of plastic per week? Yeah. So if that means doing everything in your power to limit the amount of artificial substances getting absorbed into your body, whether it's not wiping your butt with Charmin anymore because it's got whatever rubber polymer plastic shit in it. And that's going to go in through your little asshole and get into your body. <laughs> Cut that. I use bamboo toilet paper now, dude. That's Damn. Weird. Yeah. Um, you ever use a bidet? No. Dude, you got to get one. I've heard good things. Life changing. I kind of just want to use one just for fun. Bro, you can use mine. Cool. Yeah. Is it here? <laughs> that's I don't a... even have to poop. Can I just Bro, use it after? Yes, feel right, free. Dope. Hell yeah. Dude, there's nothing quite like <laughs> getting a cold blast of tap water up your bum hole. Yeah. First thing in the morning. Yeah. Well, it's... you should get a filter for your home so that it's re-ozonated or yes. whatever the fucking word yeah, is. Yeah, the bidet yeah. water. So that you're yeah. not ingesting tap water through your butthole. It's just tap water that I'm using mm -hmm. at this point. Yeah. That's okay. You'll learn. But it's You'll seriously life changing. <laughs> and it's like a hundred bucks on Amazon to oh, get Oh cool. Okay. Yeah. It's Don't. like it attaches to your toilet. It's I think the brand is it's tushy. This is the brand. I have no nice. affiliation with them. It's like a hundred it's a hundred dollar contraption that you get on Amazon. Do you have a shower filter head? I did get one of those. You did get one? Yeah. Okay, good. I don't That's another it, thing. I don't know. I don't think it's doing anything though, to be honest. Because uh, the I, water flows so rapidly through it. Like what's it what what could that possibly be removing? And did you use one? I do. Uh, I use the Jolie. That's what I have. Yeah. And it when I looked it up, it seemed like it does help. I feel really because good the water about myself. Pressure, yeah. When I, I mean, my it. hair feels better after showers, for mm. sure. Like It feels less dry and weird once it dries. Cool. It just feels like normal hair. Um, but it's like all these little micro shifts in your life. All these little things from toilet paper to plastic water bottles to uh, the shower head. Like you're, you're cutting out the junk that's going into your body, even on a micro atomic level. Don't you just want 
less of that. That's that's my argument. Like you don't have to be scared of receipt paper, but if it's part of if it's easy to avoid, why not just kind of avoid it? Yeah. I took a receipt the other day in my two fingers and I just threw it away. <laughs> and then I like wipe my fingers real quick. But I like that. yeah. You know, that's not crazy. No. So I, I, what's crazy is wearing a mask outside in the sunshine while you're walking your dog and no one else is around. That's crazy. Right? That's actually crazy. That's yeah. actually crazy. Yeah. Uh, so when it comes to like fear mongering stuff, that's my barometer now. Yeah. Yeah. Awareness is key. Yeah. But then I, I also think that if you're the kind of person who's drinking like, you know, a 20 ounce soda every day, Yeah. you know, Maybe that, you know, maybe fix that first before you Dude. feel compelled to move on to the shower head filter. Drink, yeah. Did you drink soda growing up? Yeah. Yeah, I drank a lot. You did? I drank a lot of soda. I think I cut soda sometime in or right after college. I've been off soda completely for a little bit over 10 years. It's great. And But I drank, I drank a solid amount of soda growing up. There's this dude on TikTok who's addicted to soda. <laughs> like addicted. He'll drink, I think, maybe like four to seven gallons in a day jesus like a lot dude. wow yeah is he morbidly obese no no he's not like a jacked super healthy looking guy he just looks kind of normal but i can't imagine what the inside looks like dude. you know he does do mostly diet soda so i guess that's the caveat but fuck that's me. better yeah it, you know soda is literally poison yeah it's really bad it's really bad. It's really bad. Sugar sweetened, yeah. Sugar yeah. sweetened beverages are the worst. Yeah, I totally agree. At a, at a certain point in my like childhood, I I made the switch to diet soda, and I was the one in the, in, the, in my oh, friend yeah? group that was drinking diet soda. Yeah, yeah, and I got made fun of for it, but I just I <laughs> I, I, I I've because I've always been interested in health and nutrition, like from a really young age, for as long as I can remember. Is that and what you studied in college too? I didn't. No, I'm an autodidact. I've like everything I know. I've learned. Cool. Yeah, on my awesome. own. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, that was like a I really early. I was eating like Burger King with Diet Coke. Yeah. I was like ostracized by my friends. Are there any health trends right now that you have called bullshit on or mm. like have questions about like, and, and these can be like biohacking things, you know, raw milk is big sauna, cold plunge, contrast therapy, uh, peptides, hmm. uh, intermittent fasting. Like, is there anything that has raised a red flag or caused you to be like, eh, I don't really know about that one. Yeah. Wow. That's a good question. Um, man, I am not, well, veganism. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. That's the obvious one. Yeah, I guess. totally. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but you can't say that cause no, because yeah. then you're a toxic male. Yeah, so. toxic male, far right conspiracy theorist. Mm -hmm. um, hate the environment, of course. And you're misogynist. Yeah, don't forget that. And a misogynist. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. I've ta I take a, a moderate approach on pretty much like everything. I think there's I think there's utility for everything in the right context. I mean, mm -hmm. intermittent fasting could be really useful, but I don't really do it that much these days. Yeah. Um, and you know there is a lot of there is a lot of stuff that's being marketed and sold, and I think that's a big problem, especially for people who are tight on cash and, um, and and for whom you know these these gadgets, biohacking tools or whatever, just distract from like the big picture stuff, like mm -hmm. the the high leverage, like big rocks. I think today, from a public health standpoint, like most people would be well suited to just eat more whole foods and foods of both plant and animal origin, prioritizing protein and, and things like that, you know? Yeah. Like, like there aren't enough people that are doing that Yeah. for me to like perseverate on some like, you know, highfalutin, like biohacking yeah, gizmo yeah, yeah. or gadget. But, yeah. um, but I think there's utility for all of it. Like even red light, which I'm still so skeptical of because to yeah. me it just seems like science fiction. I'm yeah, so skeptical. I know. That's a weird one. Yeah, it's a, weird, a weird one. I have a red light device. Uh, there's definitely something happening there, I think. Because I'll, I'll hold it up to like my ankle really close on like a workout day. I've always had ankle issues. Mm. And I'll do like a 15-minute thing. And afterwards, my ankle's like kind of buzzing very lightly. Is that because it just got blasted with warm light for 15 minutes? Yeah. Or because the red light penetrated my flesh and is mm. doing something in there? I have no idea. 
I have no idea. But think about how good you feel like if you've ever been outside at dawn or dusk yeah. with your shirt yeah. off. Like think yep. about how good Dude, that one of the feels. one of my favorite biohacks is waking up right before the sun comes up. Mm. And like forcing myself to go outside and watch it come up with my eyes. Did that like for the first time in a long time a few weeks ago and had like the best day. I was wow. awake the whole day. I was firing on all cylinders the whole day. And it's different from waking up at 5 a.m. to go catch a flight and seeing the sun come up from seat 2A on Delta. But uh, it's it, it was it was really nice. It was really nice. That was, I want to do that more. Yeah. You know, it's just going to mean going to bed a little earlier. That's tough. I'm kind of a night owl. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Well, dude, this was so fun. Bro, I appreciate you, man. Yeah. Love, you rock, dude. Love your work. I love your work. I'm a fan. Thank you, bro. I've gotten to see you perform a few times at this point. Yeah. And you're just so great. Thank you, bro. At what you do. I appreciate it. Are you on tour right now or what? I am. Yeah, I'm kind of always out and back a little bit. I got shows coming up uh, Phoenix, November 21st, Portland, December 7th, and then a big show in LA in February. Um, Brentpella.com slash shows. I'll add more too. And then... Dope, dude. Yeah. I appreciate you, man. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and if anybody wants to see my, my comedy specials out, uh, it's called Conscious Bro. It's on YouTube. It's for free. So you can type in Conscious Bro. It's out there. I haven't seen that. I got to watch that. It's a good time. That. Wow. Yeah. yeah, it's a good time. When did you put that out? Put that out in March. Amazing. Yeah, a couple of months ago. Wow, so yeah. cool. Yeah. Can't wait to watch it. I got one last question for you before we get to that. Where? Yeah. Uh, what are your social handles? Like, let people know. Just yeah, like, Brent Pella, B R E N T P E L L A. New videos every week, almost every day, with all the madness that's going on, um, and with the intention to help you laugh through it. Hell yes, yeah. that's that's the mission. That's the goal, and uh, hopefully you can laugh through it with an avocado in one hand and a piece of raw fish in the other. Yeah, hopefully. Well, you, know? you, del you get deli that DHA, baby. Get that DHA. <laughs> Well, you deliver on that, man. So thank you. Um, last question that gets asked everybody on the show. What does living a genius life mean to you? Mm. Living a genius life. Um, it means looking down on anybody who's not as smart as you <laughs> and making sure they know you are the genius and they are subordinate. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, gen genius life to me, it's your life. It's your life. Focus on your life, your individual mental, spiritual, emotional, and physical health. And if you can master uh, all four of those areas, you'll probably be a god. I don't think anybody's going to master those areas. But maybe the mission in life is not to master those areas, but to get as close to mastering those areas as possible. So becoming a genius in each of those four areas will put you on the path to living uh, a beautiful life of mm. abundance. You know? Um, that's what I'm trying to do. That's the goal. Amen. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there.